Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Inget Zoom Series 24. Today, our guest is uh, Dr. Alifad Salve. Dr. Alifad Salve is an assistant professor of TESOL and applied linguistics and the chair of the Teaching English as a Foreign Language program at Middle East Technical University, uh, Northern Cyprus campus. Due to his invaluable academic contributions uh, in our field, he was recognized as one of the uh, one of TESOL International Association's 30 up and coming leaders in recognition of his potential to shape the future of both the association and the profession for years to come. His title this evening is Resistance Against English Medium Instruction in the Digital Age. Thank you, dear uh, Alifato Jam, for accepting to be our guest and welcome again. The screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Ojam. It's very nice to be here with you all virtually. So warmest greetings from Northern Cyprus. And I hope you just had a light uh, iftar or dinner because I'm planning to offer you some extra food for a thought. <laughs> so uh, first of all, hello and bonjour and ahoy and aloha and zdrastivite and marhaba uh, from Northern Cyprus. And particularly wanted to start uh, this presentation with this uh, particular visual actually uh, for two main reasons. Num number one, as you might guess, this actually gives us a very nice overview of the notion of multilingualism in, in, in today's world. But of course, that's the obvious reason, right? So, but the uh, slightly less obvious reason is, as you can see, the word hello is uh, in uh, the English word, hello is strategically set, uh, placed at the very center with the uh, capitalization mark at the end. So throughout this presentation, we're gonna be talking about um, a lot on um, artifacts and choices and, and deliberate uh, purposes behind our choices, right? So uh, the, the global, the unprecedented global spread of English and globalization uh, have served as, uh, as ser collectively have served as catalyst towards marketization and internationalization of education uh, throughout the world, especially in uh, in non Anglo American so in non Anglo speaking world. Uh, as a result, we see then unprecedented increase in the. Um, Englishization process in the form of, in the various forms actually, uh, including, uh, including English as medium of instruction uh, practices. As you can see, if we take a look at the language and the content continuum, we see various forms and approaches, right? On the one end of the spectrum, we can see the English as a, an academic purposes where our focus, like in the School of Foreign Languages across the country in institutions of higher education, we uh, place considerable emphasis in, on uh, English as an academic subject matter. So uh, this is pretty evident in English dominant as well as in global context, especially at tertiary levels. Somewhere in between, we've got the language learning, uh, uh, learning language and content uh, it's slightly in a more balanced way. So we see the content and language integrated interactions in non-English dominant and mainly Europe, we see in secondary and some tertiary education. However, our focus is going to be on the other end of the spectrum where we see a considerable, and in some cases, almost exclusive emphasis on the content as in the form of English medium instruction. This is pretty much evident, as you might know, in non-English dominant context around the world, uh, and interestingly across all levels, including primary, secondary, uh, and even tertiary. So just like any um, presentation, any conversation, any research article, I wanted to start our conversation by operationalizing our definition of English as a medium of instruction. In certain cases, I'll be referring to as English medium instruction. So this is pretty much the same thing. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to uh, rely on Ernesto Macaro's widely cited code uh, to talk about English medium instruction. He says, and I quote, the use of the English language to teach academic subjects other than English itself in countries or jurisdictions where the first language of the majority of the population is not English. So as a corollary, uh, it actually tells us 
a couple of other things. Number one, English in EMI settings is the language, language used for instruction. English is not the subject being taught. So we're talking about for, um, content areas such as science uh, or in social sciences and applied sciences and, and hard sciences, uh, engineering, uh, medicine, law, whatever. Uh, and also we're talking about language development, not as a primary outcome. But all, uh, and, and finally, for most participants, English is, uh, is actually the second language. Um, I briefly talked about this, but just to put this ideas into perspectives, EMI programs in, higher, in, in European higher education, as you can see, has been skyrocketing uh, in the past couple of decades. As you can see, uh, back in 2002, there were about 725 EMI programs offered in uh, various institutions of higher education across Europe. And fast forward to 2014, this number has increased to more than eight. So we see that EMI programs are here and they'll probably be here to stay. For this reason, Ernesto Makara has a very nice uh, way of putting this into perspective at the Oxford EMI uh, Research Group. Uh, they actually consider EMI phenomenon as an unstoppable train which has already left the station. So the reason, if you're wondering why on earth we're, uh, we're seeing so many research articles, books, edited volumes, special issues, uh, and monographs published around the uh, around the ideas or around the phenomenon of English medium instruction. That's because the train has already left the station. And what we're trying to do is actually, as researchers, trying to catch up with the catch up with the train. So, however, English as a medium of instruction is, as you can see on this visual, is a double-edged sword. It's not an easy phenomenon to understand. Um, and of course, different people have different take on it um, and, and, and for a wide variety of different reasons. So if you can take a look at the um, EMI quote unquote debate, on one hand of the equation, we see the proponents of EMI um, who are actually supporting EMI practices because those practices, those programs actually afford an opportunity for internationalization through student and faculty mobility. So rather than a brain drain, it actually creates uh, some kind of a brain gain. So, but also improvement of intercultural competences and, and of domestic students, as you know, English is serving as a world's or international lingua franca. The other thing that EMI programs, the reason, the other reason that EMI programs are adopted, not just uh, in Turkey, but also in different parts of the world is because, uh, because of its additive value, uh, sharpening international image, prestige, and reputation that brings to the educational institution. So that is one way to quote unquote market the institutional uh, the institutions and their programs. Uh, and finally, because of the reason why, or due to the fact that uh, many researchers are working in English uh, for scholarly purposes, now we can see uh, the tremendous growth of uh, the availability of instructional and research materials. On the, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. So it's, this was only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin actually uh, brings considerable criticisms against the EMI phenomenon. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the opponents of uh, EMI phenomenon actually argue, they argue that the uh, EMI practices bring significant linguistic and cognitive demands uh, for individuals, uh, for our students, and thus leading to poor achievement as compared to uh, monolingual or first language instruction. Uh, on the other hand, uh, or in addition to that, um, um, EMI has been under quite um, criticism and under attack because there is a considerable dearth of qualified workforce. Because as you know, uh, teaching EMI means not just means um, being very versed and, and, and, and skilled in your subject area, but it also brings an additional uh, set of qualities and, and practices as, a, as, a, as an instructor who can convey this uh, highly uh, highly complex subject matter in a target language in a second language uh, in an effective way so you need to be a very you need to be an expert in your subject area but also you need to be an excellent teacher in in english also uh, individuals who are adopting a more uh, critical perspective regarding the uh, emi practices 
argue that the EMI practices causing a driving force, causing or exacerbating educational inequalities in the country and in different various strata of the society. In other words, issues related to access, issues related to uh, equality and equity are, are seen as, uh, or, or, or, or perpetuated by the EMI practices are seen as, uh, as major problems running through uh, the educational as well as social strata. Also, uh, one last point that I would like to add with regards to uh, not disadvantages, but also criticism against EMI is promoting neoliberalist ideologies. For example, one typical way is to, uh, it, one typical example that, are, uh, that is given by the researchers is the university rankings. So is, uh, uh, since university rankings place considerable emphasis on um, uh, in practices, um, regarding uh, or emphasizing and solidifying English and in activities structure or um, organized around English. So these are promoting neoliberalist ideologies. So uh, it's a very thorny question and, and it's not something unique to, to our context. But let's, for the sake of our conversation, let's take a closer look at the local context. And of course, Turkey, cannot remain and of course has not remained unaffected by the global winds of change um, and of course the Englishization sweeping through uh, the entire world uh, in the name of you can say on one hand internationalization on the other hand exacerbating the inequalities so all these different reasons so um, as as Joshua John mentioned once so Turkey has not been conquered by any of the western powers it's it hasn't been a um, it hasn't been a, a former colony, so English does not necessarily serve for international purposes, communication purposes, but still foreign language. So the access to English and, uh, and Yabanji did and foreign language uh, through English is seen a vital quality of an educated, uh, educated citizen, educated member of, of the society. So in, in our context, when someone refers to Yabancı or foreign language, they probably mean English. Of course, uh, it's a very uh, narrow way to look at foreign languages or Yabancı in the first place, but that is, uh, that is the first way to look at it. So English is interestingly the most widely taught foreign languages all the way from pre-K levels to PhD levels and even beyond that. Um, uh, the latest statistics argues that the 87% of the foreign language teachers in K through 12 state schools are, uh, are English teachers. Uh, English is the most widely used foreign medium of instruction. Um, as early as 2014, 20% of the undergraduate programs adopted EMI in, in some form of EMI uh, in, the, in the local context. And interesting, English is also the most widely tested foreign language. Um, the situation in Turkey is somewhat similar. So there are some push factors and pull factors. So it's like a tug of war. So English and EMI practices are seen um, by different people as different uh, or conceptualized differently. On the one hand, we see that English uh, and EMI practices are seen as a major source of appreciation because it brings cognitive advantages, because it promotes global interconnectedness and obviously intercultural uh, encounters. However, on the other hand, EMI practices are also seen as a major source of dissatisfaction. So it, they're seen as a, a major driving force causing degeneration of the Turkish language, culture, and identity, which, we, which may be referred to, collectively referred to as uh, the Turkishness, right? So um, in, the, in the current or uh, the current rising ultranationalism, anti-Westernist discourse and conspiracy-driven rhetoric uh, that has been going on in the country for at least for a couple of, uh, for a couple of decades, uh, actually uh, uh, served as a catalyst understanding uh, EMI as a major ideological fault line running through the educational and social strata in the, in the society. So English together with EMI are, are under a serious debate under serious criticism and has been seen as a major ideological fault line. So, which is why uh, if you take a look at the literature, EMI practices are referred to as a fundamental mistake, a destruction, a deadlock, 
obsession, uh, violation of human rights, and uh, and even even a, or danger or even spreading tumor, adopting some unfortunately some pathological discourses. So, in response to these um, perspectives, let's put it that way. Uh, we see that various groups, both formal and informal, adopt um, adopt this as a major, uh, let's put it, a um, major incentive or major um, uh, um, driving force to engage in social responsibility campaigns, public awareness campaigns, social sorumluluk projects, however you want to call it, or initiatives to protect, quote unquote, the protect uh, the Turkish language, Turkish society, identity and culture from, quote unquote, contamination and foreignization. And of course, these are words uh, that are used to, as euphemisms against, or, or instead of um, Englishization. It, some of these actors are formal actors, as you might guess, uh, the language academy of the uh, the language academy in the country turkish language association unofficial language academies as well the turkish language association uh sorry the language association the association for revitalization of the turkish language and some ngos for example ankara chamber of commerce is one and professional associations include as well advertising creators association and quite interesting the student clubs at universities and high schools so all these major actors they engage in initiatives in campaigns and social responsibility projects to protect the identity turkish language turkishness in a way so and their major focus are are trifold let's put it that way or or tripartite so it includes uh foreign languages in used in business discourses like the uh, the most obvious version is the business naming practices so all those um business uh, all those businesses or shop names adopting uh, foreign elements mostly english elements uh have been under serious, uh, serious criticism. The insensitive and incorrect use of the language in traditional and social media. I'm sure you have either have seen or subjected to um, a grammar Nazi, you know, uh, making comments about your use of the language in social media. At some point you, uh, you might have seen or seen examples or, uh, or been a, a victim of that. And of course the, the last area, uh, which is, um, our current emphasis, our current focus in this presentation is the use of foreign languages. And of course, uh, when it comes to use of foreign languages as a medium of instruction, uh, foreign languages here means English. So the use of English as a medium of instruction in schools. The one that you see on the left is a typical example of a poster um, uh, encouraging individuals to uh, to be, or to raise their awareness, to raise their sensitivity and understanding uh, in using, in being a uh, more careful user uh, when it comes to the Turkish language. So it says, Türkçe dünyanın en köklü, en zengin ve en güzel dillerinden biri. Onu yabancı sözcüklerle kirletmeyin. Türkçe kullanın, dilinizden utanmayın. So these campaigns and initiatives, if, uh, I'm sure you've seen some of them. Uh, I'm sure these conversations seem quite uh, quite familiar to you. Um, for the most part, they adopted very traditional ways. I'm sure you've seen some news reports or sometimes you've uh, come across some newspaper ads or you've seen some TV shows um, in which language enthusiasts or scholars or linguists uh, or language policy makers uh, sharing their views on on, on this current phenomenon. Um, on the other hand, we also see some billboard ads, public seminars, and interestingly also uh, individual visits to business places, trying to convince them so that they can adopt um, Turkish business naming practices. So uh, from a, uh, I, I'm not going to go further into deta detail uh, and I do not want to bore you death uh, with too much theory throughout the presentation, but just one concept that will help. Well, I'll talk about a couple of concepts. One of them is the Foucaultian concept of policing, which is uh, defined as defined by uh, Jan Blomert, uh, may he rest in peace, um, uh, as the rational production of order, normatively organized and police conduct. So this uh, one way of looking at these acts and uh, um, in, um, these acts and initiatives and are, are somewhat policing uh, activities. The other thing that I would like to talk about is uh, quite 
unrelated to what we're talking about. And you may be wondering why on earth we're talking about uh, social networking sites here. Uh, interestingly, social networking sites, and especially uh, Facebook, has been evolving, has been emerging as a new front for language policing. And I'll talk about what I mean by that in a few seconds. So, but before that, uh, why Facebook? I mean, as you can see on the previous slide, if I go back, as you can see, there are different options here. There are different uh, social networking sites, and this is not the exhaustive list here, uh, but why Facebook? So, uh, and by the way, this presentation hasn't been officially supported by Facebook. So uh, Facebook is interesting because it is uh, the most popular social media network with two, more than 2.8 billion users. Uh, who use it to stay connected for a wide variety of different uh, different reasons. Maybe you're just on Facebook to um, uh, to reunite with your uh, with your uh, primary school friends, or uh, to get in touch with the rest of your family, uh, or to post something or post um, photos of your cat doing all these uh, sorts of crazy things in, at your house. Uh, but there are, I mean, individuals use it for, uh, to use it to stay connected with, uh, with the wider community. So if you take a look at the active users, we uh, staggering numbers, 1.84 billion, and, and there are more than 600 million groups used by uh, nearly uh, a billion and a half people. So of course the situation is somewhat similar here uh, or there in Turkey. Uh, to, um, in Turkey, um, Facebook is the ultimate social networking platform uh, with nearly 60 million users. And we're talking about um, a country with 84 million people. So think about how uh, interesting that number would be. And it's one of the top 10 countries with most Facebook users. So I was a curious cat, hoping that the curiosity will not kill me. I was wondering what else, whether there is a connection, because from time to time, when I spend some time on social networking sites, uh, and of course, I'm also on Facebook. So I come across those instances of, wait, this is not about, this is not, uh, this is an interesting and sort of atypical way of using uh, quote unquote, a social networking site. So when I saw those examples, I was curious if this is actually a thing. So I was interested in this question, what ideologies about EMI are communicated through visual and textual artifacts? And by this, I mean group names, descriptions, and EMI related visuals in focal Facebook, uh, focal groups on, on Facebook. Uh, this is interesting and important, I believe, uh, particularly because uh, working on language policing and, and or any sorts of language policy and planning activities and social networking sites, when we combine them, when we merge them together, it actually gives us a very powerful lens to understand new and non-traditional actors. Uh, by new and non-traditional actors, I mean individuals, right? So individuals like you and I, who are actually layperson, random individuals, not just language academies, but uh, uh, a, a traditional, uh, a, a traditional a random individual, right? A new, non-traditional grassroots. We're talking about uh, individual, um, individual initiative and organized around the ideas and ideals of resistance. Here, uh, those groups that are established on Facebook are actually purposed around the ideas and ideals of resistance and engaged in normative acts of being and becoming at the nexus of linguistic and national identities. They are actually supporting um, a certain ideology in a normative way um, at, the, at the intersections of linguistic and national identities. And they're doing this through employing discursive practices and artifacts afforded by widely used, less controllable and non-traditional digital platform. And that is Facebook. So in other words, I was very much interested in how language serves as an index and a link between power and ideology because social networking sites, they actually give us stance rich environments uh, from a researcher point of view. So I was interested in this question and I started my inquiry by adopting a multi-level procedure to identify, okay, what are some more research relevant fields of studies uh, 
uh, what are some more research relevant groups that I can find on Facebook? So I started with the basic keyword searches, both on Google and Facebook. I used random keywords uh, at the beginning, uh, such as Turkish, well, of course, not random, uh, informed uh, keywords, but uh, rather large, like Turkish or foreign medium instruction, uh, both in Turkish and in, uh, in English, of course. And also used uh, the suggestions by, you know, when once you search something, when you come up with a result, and obviously Facebook also tells you, oh, here are some other groups, pages, people, and posts that you may be interested in or something related to your search. I also um, worked on those suggestions um, given to me by the Facebook's search option. So as a result, I, I was able to identify my initial list of groups were about 24. And when I looked deeper into those groups, so I eliminated some of them for various reasons. Number one, some of them did not have a critical focus. Uh, they did not have any, um, any activist orientation. So there were, for example, some of them were just foreign language education programs at different institutions of higher education in the country. So I discarded them. Um, some of them did not have enough members. Um, for example, some only had one, so it, it did not make really uh, any sense to focus on that group because it, like I said earlier, it does not really give us any stance rich environment. And finally, again, which is also related to stance richness, the idea of stance richness, uh, not, ha not having active and recent discussions was another criterion uh, that helped me to eliminate those, uh, those groups. So as a result, I worked on these four groups here that you see here on the slide. The Resurrection Movement of Turkish, Lovers of the Turkish Language, those who say that Turkish has never suffered this much since it became Turkçe, and no to foreign, lang uh, foreign language medium instruction. So even a perfunctory look at uh, these words, uh, these titles, give you some ideas about their perspective, uh, give you some idea about how they position themselves on the ideological spectrum and where how they um, view themselves and how they construct uh, the, the ideas around, around English medium instruction or broader in, in a broader sense, the Turkish language or Turkishness. So, and as you can see, all of those groups have been founded after 20 or on or, at, sorry, in or after 2010, which also gives us uh, an indication that this is a relatively new area and recent phenomenon. As you can see, uh, the number of likes for those groups range between uh, 1,200 to more than nearly 1 million, and they all included textual and audiovisual um, elements and artifacts. So uh, I've was, I've been, I lurked for a year, which means being an invisible onlooker uh, and engaged in the practice of observing uh, quite passively without participating in an uh, electronic communication. I was wondering what my friends uh, thought when I started um, liking all those groups. Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed that, but there seems to be a, a, an interesting conversation that I need to have with them. So uh, data collection involved observ uh, observing and familiarizing myself with the culture. So like I said, I was a lurker. I um, frequently, be because we all spend some time on social networking sites, uh, part of my um, daily activities actually uh, involved looking at uh, the post activities, discussions and artifacts in those spaces. Uh, and of, of course, another good thing about uh, social networking sites is even if you, for example, if you're busy or for some reason you cannot log on to your social networking site, you can always go back because there is this whole archive, uh, which enables me to systematically collect online visual artifacts centered around the EMI phenomenon or the EMI debate. So throughout this time, I kept an electronic researcher journal, um, writing down any notes or comments that may potentially illuminate my uh, data collection analysis and interpretation sense-making process. Uh, when I was working with the visuals, uh, this is the criteria that I use. Um, and obviously, as you might guess, um, those groups, they basically have, although they have, they clearly have a specific, they clearly have a very specific language and uh, identity focus, they 
post all sorts of different um, on all sorts of different topics and EMI is only one of them. So therefore I want, I, uh, I decided that I needed to um, develop a kind of a data collection, uh, sorry, um, um, an image collection criteria. So first of all, the image that should be in, uh, in order for an image to be recorded, it should have an explicit textual message about EMI. So for example, an image and underneath it says something like no to foreign language medium instruction. So uh, it, it's a check, so I recorded those kind of images. The images also should have an explicit visual message about EMI, maybe not textually on the, on the visual, but also uh, visually, right? So for example, a university raising, uh, raising the foreign language flag, and I'll show you the example in a few minutes. So you will see that um, that also uh, is considered as a check mark for uh, for the data collection purposes or this uh, from data collection perspective and finally the image should be shared in a post about emi so as a result i ended up um, receiving or collecting uh, 36 images that are related to emi phenomenon uh, and i included them in the final study uh, one idea that i would like to and in relation to language policing is the idea of recontextualization. That means adding elements or broadening the discourse or the scope to achieve legitimacy, purpose, and reactions. And I'll see you and I'll show you uh, how different, uh, different Facebook groups actually used linguistic and rhetorical elements and strategies in creating and maintaining and recontextualizing broader discourses connected to resistance and normativity. In the data analysis part, okay, this, I know you've been eagerly waiting for the act to show, show us the actual thing. Um, I know you've been uh, working for this. So uh, let's talk about the data analysis. So um, data analysis is twofold, actually. I'll share some of the textual uh, elements and visual elements. For textual elements, I mean uh, the group names and for, um, as well as the mission statements, the about section on Facebook. And also with regards to visuals, I'll show you some images. Let's talk about findings. Uh, yes, we'll talk about the textual um, group names and mission statements. First, uh, we got the those who say that Turkish has never, never suffered this much since it became Turkçe. So as you can see, we hear, first of all, we see that those who say that plus a proposition, a proposition uh, structure here. So those who say, işte bilmem ne e, yap, e, şunu şunu söylemeyen bilmem kaç milyon kişi bulabilirim. Once upon a time, it was back on uh, um, back in the early days. I think it was quite popular. Uh, those kind of uh, uh, Facebook groups. I think they're getting um, out of date, but this group particularly used that those who say that plus proposition and which is i believe a morphosyntactic structure creating and perpetuating in-group and out-group membership lines drawn by a very assertive value-laden and evaluative judgment about the turkish language so the other thing that i would like to attract your attention to is the word Turkjes, but spelled in the englishized version as i call it so here we see the um a very careful, very interesting use of um, the, the word Türkçe in an Englishized form, underscoring the process of Englishization. I can't see any better way of uh, understanding and underscoring uh, this process. And, and of course, when you combine that with the rest of the proposition, so it serves as a major um, is a major perceived threat against Turkishness. And also from a, a netiquette perspective, the use of all caps means shouting in the digital world. So collectively, so we see here that the digitization and transformation of the discourses of the online, offline world into the online world, uh, as Tharlow et al. argues, complexifying and blurring the demarcation between the two, which is known as the collision uh, contexts. The other group was called the resurrection movement of Turkish. Well, if you, as soon as you use the word resurrection, that means the current status is dead. So, which gives us an interesting perspective, how this group 
and group uh, administrators um, actually view the current status of Turkish. Res uh, resurrection also means restoring the language to the original state, which is pretty much pure free from uh, any kind of contamination. The other word that I would like to track your attention to is the word movement here. So here, uh, this group is pretty um, specific about its focus using Facebook group as a space for activism and or, or according to Dean, collectivism, right? Raising awareness on or promoting social change and transformation of a socio-political issue, which is Turkishness in the, in the virtu virtual world. The third one is called lovers of the Turkish language. Uh, the use of the word lover, uh, which is denoting and promoting lingophile sentiments towards Turkish, although uh, the word sevda is actually an Arabic origin word, uh, that is also one interesting catch about it. So uh, here we see that the link between Turkish and such characteristics as collective self-esteem, right? and the need to belong and ultimately contributing to individual possible political selves and their uh, microactivist uh, identities. And the last one, as you can see, no to foreign language uh, medium instruction is very clear, direct and explicit, right? No, we don't want foreign language medium instruction and that is it. Foreign language, as you, can, as you will see in a few minutes, uh, foreign language is equated to in English, uh, which actually recontextualizes the discussion and broadens the sphere of influence of this phenomenon. All right, so what we covered so far is, let's talk about the common threads. What we covered so far is the, uh, the critical importance of names and naming practices. Names and naming practices in any fields of um, inquiry in any walks of life, in any context, encapsulate a wide range of issues of power, domination, inclusion, exclusion, and ideology. So for those, um, for those of you in the audience who are looking for, maybe um, emerging scholars and graduate students are looking for uh, an interesting uh, and potential side for, side for uh, critical discourse analysis research, uh, they may, have a clear and, and a clear emphasis and clear interact, uh, focus on names and naming practices as a line of inquiry. The other thing is with regards to uh, group names, as you can see, once you look for something on, uh, on Facebook or any social networking site or any search engine, for example, group names, or when you see somebody actually, um, when you see on Facebook that so-and-so has just joined or liked this page of this group, so on and so forth. So as soon as you see the group names, right, the group names um, are the first encounters. That is the first thing that you as a visitor or you as a Facebook user um, see, right? And it attract their attention to these groups, which uh, revolve around discourses of normativity exclusion and power are enacted and circulated. And of course, those group names are imbued with power-driven language ideologies regarding not just past and present, but also the future of the Turkish language. And in some ways, as, as we will see in a few minutes, their connections to English medium instruction policies uh, and programs. The other thing that I would like to share with regard to textual artifacts is the about section on Facebook. About section, I don't know, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Facebook are already probably familiar with the about section, but for those who may not necessarily know more about this or or not on Facebook, uh, each and every single uh, Facebook group has a section called about in which uh, group administrators uh, group administrators are given a chance to uh, provide a very brief and succinct in, uh, in, in, um, description about their group uh, and their goals and so on and so forth. So I, when I looked at different groups um, or the about sections in these groups, uh, I wanted to include, I wanted to uh, take a closer look at those descriptions um, 
and categorize them in terms of micro goals and macro goals. By macro goals, I mean language purification and opposing EMI that is more specific to language itself, but also macro goals, right? Reshaping and redesigning sociolinguistic pillars of Turkey and Turkishness and Turkish language using such concepts as nation, language, fate, and linguistic flag. For example, take a look at these short micro term, uh, sorry, micro or short term goals. Uh, group three says maintaining linguistic awareness and purifying the language from the foreign words uh, that are byproducts of wannabism or prevo uh, preventing erosion of the language and to create a language as clean as possible or opposing foreign language medium instruction and supporting efforts uh, to revise educational curriculum and infrastructure so that foreign language is provided. So as you can see, there is a clear emphasis on the micro, like, like on, the, on the language itself. But take a look at the ones on the right, macro and long-term goals. So these are broader, these are uh, macro scale, Goals contributing to the unifying power of language and the concept of nation. So that word is critical here. Completing the language reform spearheaded by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Uh, here we see the uh, the use of a publicly known figure and the and of course the use of the word reform, the language reform, changing the fate of Turkish by lowering the linguistic flag of imperial nations and replacing it with Turkish. So as you can see, those groups, they had micro and short-term goals related to language, but also had macro long-term broader goals about uh, Turkish language, Turkish identity, Turkish culture, or Turkishness in general. So collectively, what we can uh, summarize here is that these groups actually position themselves as informal regulatory authorities with specific goals of educating visitors and mobilizing their members for activism. In, in, because when it's done online, it's called collectivism and protecting the language in a somewhat a top-down fashion. So in other words, uh, they're utilizing linguistic normativity blended with nationalist discourses. All right, let's talk about the visuals. So visuals uh, that I'd like to share with you actually include uh, three different categories. Number one, the first category is those visuals that oppose EMI directly. Okay, here are some examples. Yabancı dille öğretime hayır, yabancı dille eğitim hayır. No to foreign language medium instruction. So as you can see, uh, the use of explicit terms higher, uh, no, embellished in bigger font marks and bigger font size and bold typeface and all caps with an exclamation mark is, is pretty common here. So here are indexing some kind of negative sentiments and ideological, ideological stance. This is the next one uh, in this category. Yabancı dille eğitime hayır, no to foreign language medium instruction. So this is interesting uh, for a number of different reasons. Number one is, as you can see, I mean, we, we already covered the, the, the textual element here, yabancı dille eğitim hayır, right? So it actually positions itself as, a, as against uh, foreign languages or um, English medium instruction. But the interesting thing here is that it recontextualizes the EMI debate in the rising Euroscepticism and anti-Westernism and nationalist isolationist discourses through the use of uh, Western flags, the deployment of visual elements um, of Western countries. So flags of Western countries, uh, as you can see, some of them are non-existent here in the foreign language medium instructions. As you can see, the, uh, the flag of Spain, the Netherlands, uh, Spanish or Dutch are not used as English or medium of instruction at all. So uh, what's the point here, right? So also there are some other languages that are less, less influential besides English, uh, the, the flags of Germany and French in the local education system. Here is another one. Türk demek, Türkçe demektir. Ne mutlu Türküm diye ne? Yabancı dille eğitime hayır. Turks mean, 
uh, Turk means Turkish. How happy is the one who says I'm a Turk? No, no to foreign language medium instruction. So here we see that the Turkish national flag, a portrait of Ataturk and national motto of the Turkish Republic and a stance on the EMI debate are actually brought together, amalgamated in such a way to create some kind of ideological positioning and regulating um, regulating this ideological stance. Here we see that a very clear example of recontextualization of the EMI debate in the broader discourses of nationalism and national identity, and, and that is Turkishness, right? The other category, that was the first category, uh, opposing EMI directly, as you can see. The other one is opposing EMI while differentiating between foreign language educating education and foreign medium language education. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. And it's, I'm, I'm not trying to confuse you. So the first one here that you see, the first two here, Türkiye'de Türkçe yabancı dil öğrenmeye evet, yabancı dille eğitime hayır. Yabancı dil öğrenmeye evet, yabancı dille eğitime hayır. That was the next one. So Turkish in Turkey, yes to foreign language education and no to foreign language medium instruction. So here the, the group or the, uh, the whoever is posting this is actually making a fine distinction between foreign language instruction and foreign language medium instruction. So this is actually a recent, uh, recent trend. Uh, if you're familiar with the work of, for example, um, Sinan Bayrak Doroğlu, um, he and several other colleagues, they are arguing that EMI practice, especially in higher education, in tertiary education, they're not only unrealistic in terms of its aims and objectives, but also posing a major threat to educational quality. So the use of yes, no here, as you can see with the capital, um, capital letters, creates an extra emphasis and mutually exclusive and decontextualized binaries. So that was eye-opening and also we see again the a portrait of uh, a portrait of Atatürk Mustafa Kemal Atatürk gazing at Turkish in Turkey portion well obviously he was looking at sky but the way that Turk, Turkey the Turkje is placed over there uh, gives us the impression that he is looking at Turkish in Turkey in other words uh, we see that recontextualization of the EMI debate within the broader discourses of nationalism and national identity, which is actually, uh, this is in sync with the current political rhetoric adopted, propagated and ratified by the current president, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's uh, famous quote, one nation, one flag, one homeland and one state. Uh, this is the last one, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So EMI threatening Turkishness and Turkish education system. This is the first visual, İngilizce öğretim şart, Eğitim, ihanet, must to learn, betrayal to use as a medium of instruction. As you can see uh, here, we see that the encapsulation and summarizing the current ultra-nationalistic and rhetoric and xenophobic attitudes to the West. You see, we, uh, here we see a clear glass of water uh, with a clearly marked by Turkish flag, contaminated. Uh, or in some cases poisoned, however you want to perceive or however you want to call it or uh, interpret it by, uh, uh, by, by, the, uh, by the Union Jack, which is the, uh, the, the flag of the UK, right? So here we see that the, um, some kind of xenophobic attitudes to the West and negative sentiments attributed to EMI evident in the local context. We're actually merging all these ideas together and deploy this in the in through this visual. So and if, of course this is also built upon the distinction between foreign language education and foreign language medium instruction. And English is regarded as a betrayal to use as a medium of instruction. This is interest uh, another one, another visual. Here we see that the visual elements um, including as you can see at the very center, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, uh, at the very center we see a broken padlock, uh, the idea of setting on fire, torn pages of, as you can see, Turkje, Turkish, Turkey Eğitimi, Turkish education, Turk University, Turkish universities, and Bilimsel Araştırma, scientific research. And here is a lighter by, an, uh, by someone 
who's not seen in the, in the visual and a hand associated as in the color as well as in the, uh, as in the lighter associated with the US because we can see that the star spangled banner, the, the flag of the US is carefully used here. And, oops, sorry. Okay, this is, I think the last one if I'm, oh no, uh, this is the penultimate one. Uh, this one says here, as you can see, here in this, uh, in this ba on this banner, bugünden sonra divanda, dergahta, bargahta ve mecliste ve meydanda Türkçeden başka dil konuşulmaya 1277. This uh, it says no one from this day on uh, would speak any other language than Turkish in the divan, which is high governmental body, the court, the council, the palace, or the town square. So here we see symbols, right? We see symbols of Turkish flag, as you can see at the in the background, actor, the major historical uh, um, historical actors that exist in the collective memory and the collective psyche of uh, in the in the local context. We see Atatürk at the center. Uh, we see Yunus Emre on the right, and and Mehmet the first of Karaman, and who are individuals who are at the crux of Turkish and Turkishness, uh, reconceptualizing the discourses by making a connection to a school building it says okul here i don't know if you can see that school uh, school building shut down as you can see by a padlock chained by the us flag and this one uh, i think it's the last one the university rising the uh, sorry the university raising the foreign language flag res rescued by a lifesaver so what, we're, what we've seen so far, ladies and gentlemen, is actual recontextualization of the EMI debate through multimodal semiotic resources. We've seen that careful utilization of actors, historical figures in, in individuals such as uh, Atatürk. We've seen the, the use of symbols such as padlock or school building, lifesaver and flags, of course, which are pretty much connected to uh, individual and national identity and expressions, slogans, executive orders, uh, and so on and so forth. We also see that uh, the flags are used as a salient marker of national identity, enacting nationalist discourses. We see clearly see the so the examples of the Union Jack and the Star, Star Spangled Banner, activating or creating connecting the dots for us, right? Connecting the dots for us for skeptical and unfavorable attitudes towards the West. So. Uh, that's why English, uh, English medium instruction is seen as a way of an agent of Englishization, equating US and the UK as the honors, owners of the English language, emphasizing language and nation state, and which somewhat contradicts uh, the current research on English as a global language or world Englishes. So uh, we teachers in general, or, uh, or language teachers in specific love big conclusions, uh, love conclusions in general. So what is the big idea that I'm trying to leave you with? So uh, the idea that I'm trying to make here is that uh, these uh, groups are engaging in language policing and grassroots pre prescriptivism to create uh, activities or instances or um, artifacts of language and education policing or educational normativity. We see that with the help of, with the affordances of Facebook groups, we see a technological transformation of the existing grassroots activism and prescriptivism, maintaining the borders and orders about language of instruction in a normatively organized fashion by means of recontextualization, nationalist discourses, symbols, and actors and here we see that the those actors and symbols uh, of nationalism and national identity in collective in activating collective memory is a very powerful strategy in the recontextualization of emi debate as you can see from this point we're not even talking about emi we're talking about big ideas making big conclusions making big assertions about who we are and who, who we are not right and this is one interesting quote by Yilmaz, who, uh, who says, and I quote, memory is not always what we remember as autonomous subjects, but we're reminded by those, of, by those in positions of authority. And therefore it is produced by and reflects a certain configuration of the balance of political forces and the hegemonic situation that exists at a certain moment in a given history. 
So what does in what does this whole presentation mean for us as ELT professionals? Okay. So first and foremost, we really cannot bury our heads in the sand, ignore power politics, values, and ideologies encapsulated in and surrounding English within the broader socio-political and educational, uh, oops, sorry, my apologies, educational context. These are some key questions for us. What we, uh, uh, we as a language user, let's talk about our dual identity as I also, I mean, earlier I talked about ELT professionals, but uh, we also have roles and responsibilities as English users, right? Uh, think about English, being an English user and being an English teacher, right, are dual identities. And if you're teaching at a uh, foreign language instruction or teacher education program, add yourself. Or uh, if, you're, um, if you're a researcher involved in any kind of research related to English or English instruction or teacher education, on top of those two identities, add your teacher education researcher identity, right? Uh, when we talk about EMI, we cannot really escape, we cannot really decontextualize E from the rest of the equation. What does English mean in the local context? So that, that is something we need to think about. What are the attitudes towards English? How is English, is, how is English perceived, right? And how is English viewed vis-a-vis -vis local language just in plural sense, right? And in relation to other languages as well. The other thing is, that we also keep in mind that anything we do in the name of ELT is connected to power and politics and has wider implications for the people we work with and society is therein. So uh, one last thing that I would like to add is that um, the sociopolitical aspects of EMI, for those of you who are looking for different um, research avenues, sociopolitical aspects of English and as well as EMI deserve a very critical scrutiny. I'm very grateful that I've met uh, Joshua Jha earlier in my graduate studies, otherwise I wouldn't be able to uh, be sitting here and, and talking to you, um, who actually informed me about look, there are different things, there are different aspects related to English other than uh, those that are, that are available to us. Think about what it really means, how it's connected to access, what does it really mean when you see it uh, used in public sphere, in, in linguistic landscape, uh, in, in, in, the, in different programs. So the other thing is that individuals that we work with, especially in pre and in-service teachers, will be surrounded by these global, uh, global discourses. By global, I mean symbiotic, the global and the local. As, um, if you are an English teacher, at some, point you, at some point in your life, you will be either be asked to position yourself in this discussion or, um, or actually think about or be, or be questioned about uh, where you position yourself and how your ideological commitments actually inform your teaching and your, I, your ideas and identities. Um, I'm sure this question will come up at some point. Uh, when I give this talk, a lot of people say, okay, what is your take on the EMI debate? Uh, this talk is not about being in favor or against EMI debate, so that's a whole different conversation. But if I may to say something about EMI, it is a big, big, big, big, I can go on and on how big it is. It is a very big and a very strategic decision and institutions and, and, and people working therein should have enough support, enough resources, and enough qualifications and tra training to be able to successfully uh, implement EMI practices. Otherwise, we're failing ourselves and we're failing our students and it will be a huge waste of time, energy, and resources, uh, both individually and collectively. And, and this research probably has shown us that uh, the, the, the, the focus on EMI practice or the sociopolitical aspects connected to English language is actually creating a, a, giving us a very new and fertile research front merging online and offline words. So when you spend some time online on social networking sites, think about yourself and your identities as a researcher. Think about if this will inform your research practices in some way. 
Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. For those of you are interested in reading a copy of, or for those of you interested in uh, receiving a copy of this presentation, can certainly email me. Here is my email. It's basically my last name followed by at metu, edu, tr. Uh, and if you're interested in reading in greater depth about this research, um, I'll be more than happy to share the copy, or you can just go to Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development. It was published earlier in 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alifad Rajam. Uh, in fact, this presentation just sounded like the funeral of reason and common sense to me. Uh, yes, Ardam Ojam, I saw your hand. I will give you the uh, stage in a minute. Um, it is uh, unbelievable to see uh, these, this level of hostility and uh, stupidity. I'm so sorry. Uh, it, it, it really made me mad. And using Atatürk as a symbol, who himself spoke at least six foreign languages, and who himself said that it is not enough to speak a language, you should also learn its literature and the linguistic features as well. And this is, this is something that he mentioned, and they're using uh, this, uh, I don't know, um, modern person for their crazy ideas. Okay, whatever. Now, I'm ready to uh, ask the questions. Can I ask you something, Ojam? Absolutely, Ojam. Uh, now, of course, it is not possible to get any information about the educational background or socioeconomical background of these, uh, the, the members of these groups. But have you, for example, uh, observed their use of English I mean, Turkish. Was was it good? <laughs> did uh, they use good Turkish? <laughs> it, some of them they did actually, and mm -hmm. when some of them derailed or digressed from quote unquote the standards, there were some uh, language policing activities within the group. So some of oh, those interactions okay. involved uh, in group uh, policing activities, mm -hmm. sometimes through jokes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, işte D'yi de mi ayıramıyorsun? Bu yaşa geldin, okay. işte D ile D'nin ayrımını da bilmiyorsun falan filan yeah. gibi. Sometimes okay. as a joke, sometimes as a, uh, as a funny comment. But all in all, um, although, as you mentioned, we don't really have about the back information about the backgrounds of the individuals because mm -hmm. these uh, groups are... Um, are available to anybody yes. who has a who has an account and who just goes ahead and clicks the uh, the, the the like button or the mm -hmm. member or the join button. Uh, but apart from that, uh, we really don't have anything besides that. But of course, the other thing that I'm um, interested in doing is actually uh, contacting the uh, the uh, the group administrators. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is obviously my sense, this is my interpretation, this is my of, way of interpreting uh, the data, uh, but of course um, their voices also need to be heard, however problematic uh, the artifacts that are, uh, you know, that are shared in the, uh, that are in, shared in this group might be. Yeah, because some of the uh, comments that you mentioned uh, sound very ignorant mm -hmm. like for example turkish has never suffered this much yeah, yeah, yeah. uh i think they don't know the history of uh, our country mm -hmm. uh, if you consider the fact that once turkish was the language of only low class villages so the uh, higher class was mm -hmm. uh, speaking uh, persian arabic and ottoman mm -hmm. so there was no turkish at all so I guess uh, these people are not that educated. Can I make that uh, uh, assumption? Uh, I, I, I, I think we can definitely make that assumption, Ojam. So, and because, like I said earlier, these are less controllable uh -huh. uh, medium and everyone has a voice. Mm -hmm. And we see that everyone has a venue and channel to spread their 
germs in some mm-hmm. case, their mm-hmm. hostility, their xenophobic attitudes and ideas, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, or use those um, avenues as a way to, in a very prescriptive sense, in a very normative sense, to regulate individuals, to, uh, to dictate their sort of ideological uh, their ideological position. Definitely. Erdogan, would you like to uh, ask your question or make your comment? Uh, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Hojam, actually, I was just clapping after the presentation. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. But that's fine. Uh, but I have something in my mind. Thank you very much, Ali Fuat Hojam. My uh, pleasure. That Hujam. was wonderful, as, as always. Um, Thank you. Hojam, I just wonder if you had a chance to look at the comments uh, you know, on, uh, below the, um, the the the pictures or the mm-hmm. uh, visuals that you have right. seen. Right, that's a good point, yeah. Ujam. Yeah. So, um, from time to time, we see that those um, those way or, or those images they did not receive any comments because uh, pretty much everyone. Well, I cannot say I cannot speak on behalf of everybody. Uh, who are members on this group, and it's impossible to know where they position themselves on the continuum, on the ideological continuum. But uh, by and large, if you go ahead and like the, a group like uh, and a group of that sort, you probably are on board with the ideas, right? So there wasn't much of a discussion. But the way I discovered this phenomenon is when some of my friends on Facebook, they when they shared when they shared some of their uh, um, their artifacts, their visuals, then I realized that, okay, this, there is something else going on in this group. So mm-hmm. I, may, I may better go ahead and look at that in greater detail from a sociolinguistic perspective. So those um, EMI related visuals did not receive a lot of comments. And when it received, it was very basic and it was very, Oh yes, I agree with that. So uh, we should we should reverse this uh, practices. Also, basic comments about that, and and I don't see anything much beyond that. But but you said I mean you touch upon a very good point. Uh, the member co- uh, member communication in those groups or in any social mm-hmm. networking sites are definitely an interesting uh, line of research for uh, for us. Uh, can I also just add something else? Oh, yeah. I just wonder if you uh, also consider looking at Twitter because, you know, uh, with the hashtags, people uh-huh. also, um, you know, um, uh, distribute uh, their ideologies, right? No, that's a very um, good point, Ujam. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, uh, I've just thought, uh, you know, if you use Google um, um, photo Angram. search, Oh, maybe, photo search. Yeah, yeah. You know, photo search. Yeah, maybe you will see the same photo like English J8 higher will be shared uh-huh. on different websites. And, uh-huh. you know, maybe those people will be using some different kind of communication. And then um, but this is just an idea. But uh, so far, I have, I've been amazed to see that it's such a great you know, topic to dig. Thank you very much, Ujam. Thank you so much, Ujam. And the, the, the two ideas that you mentioned with regards to Google Images and Twitter are just great. Uh, I'm actually thinking about, uh, I was thinking about working with a Twitter hashtag as well as a Twitter account. So I'll definitely keep you, <laughs> keep you in mind. Thank you, Ujam. Thanks uh, for your kind comments. Yeah. Social media um, is the best uh, place for... Um, BSing, mm-hmm. sorry, <laughs> I didn't want to use the f- full word, and bullying other people. So, uh, mm-hmm. yes, I totally agree with Erdemoja and you. You can definitely find thousands, tens of thousands of uh, stupid comments and uh, shares. Uh, I know that you work for an uh, English medium university. So I would like to ask you whether students, learners have favorable um, attitudes toward EMI or do they show resistance? Learner's Um, perspective, your mm -hmm. personal observation. Right, right. That's related to your research. 
Exactly. So um, even though I work in an English medium instruction and, and I teach and then teaching English as a foreign language program. So individuals who come to our program, they know that they will be immersed in English throughout their education. So mm. I don't see much of a backlash, although from time to time, um, not regarding the English medium instruction itself, but from time to time, they have been suffering quite a lot from the, the monolingual orientation monolingual orientation that they've been exposed to or the English only orientation to um, that they've been exposed to in their previous education and um, and they always say can I say mm -hmm. can I make a comment in Turkish can I say this in Turkish mm -hmm. uh, it seems like we are oscillating between the pendulums whether it's only English or it's purely Turkish right so life is a lot more than blacks and whites, one or zeros, and the binaries. Mm -hmm. The world has been talking about translanguaging as a pedagogy, talking about linguistic resources that an individual has, um, and all these sorts of semiotic <coughs> resources that an individual has. I'm talking, of course, I recognize the importance of being exposed to ample amount of comprehensible input. That is great. Of course, it should be the case, but simply negating other languages, discrediting other languages, as a way of pedagogy um, is, is actually suffering. Uh, but when I talk to other students on campus, uh, they seem to be at different points on the ideological spectrum. Some of them mm -hmm. still question the effectiveness of EMI. Mm -hmm. uh, some, of them, um, some of them cannot cope with the, uh, with the challenges, with the demands and they leave or they switch institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, they recognize that uh, this will bring them long-term comments, long-term um, long benefits. Obviously on top of that, the, uh, the prestige, the social value attached to being a graduate of Middle East Technical University, right? So, and, and lifelong premiums that it will bring to them. So all these sorts of ideological and identity related um, <coughs> internal conversations that they've been going through that I can easily observe. Uh, from time to time, these uh, ideas are in the form of comments, uh, but sometimes uh, they seem to understand uh, the importance. And, and it's nice to see that they're, they're thinking about this. Uh, they're not simply here. They're not simply here to, to uh, just as passive learners or passive students, but they're thinking about being critical. Um, um, I don't know if I answer your question without much data, only based on anecdotal no, evidence. Uh, well, of course, I, I asked for your personal opinion anyways. Right. So uh, being there, living with them, I mean, of course, you're teaching... Um, uh, in the uh, foreign language education department. So, of course, you're going to teach everything in English. But I was thinking uh, in, uh, on a wider scale, for example, an engineer, uh, engineering mm -hmm. faculty student, because they have chosen mm -hmm. that university. Mm -hmm. They knew from the very beginning that it was an English medium uh, instruction university, right? Uh, because they wanted to have a prestigious diploma, university diploma. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So uh, they're either going to suffer and survive <laughs> or give up. <laughs> what I really uh, do not understand is how can people see this as inequality inequ or inequity because we have this, these concepts in uh, education in our native language as well. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give any university names here, but if you attend a certain university, you get a much better education. I'm not talking about foreign language. I'm talking about the curriculum itself or the mm -hmm. academic staff. So if we want to criticize uh, EMI, I guess we need to attack the curriculum mm -hmm. uh, or delivery or I don't know, the uh, instruction itself, not the language, because um, I'm sorry, 
I have a huge mouth. I don't know how to keep it shut. Uh, every day, a foreign word is being introduced to our language, Turkish, I mean. And these come from Arabic and Persian. And people love these words. At my age, I have never heard of these words before. Never. So if it's a, an Eastern word, it's welcome. But if it's a Western word, it's not. Isn't that really? Uh, beep, that is the censored <laughs> part. <laughs> Language, that is... language content and loan words is an interesting thing. So when, uh, when in my sociolinguistics class, we have a week devoted to uh, English in Turkey and Northern Cyprus. Mm. And uh, in that particular week, I always show students that the current pie chart, there's a pie chart uh, about loan words in Turkish um, based on the Güncel Türkçe Sözlük. And I ask them, what is the... Uh, what, what is the biggest donor to, to Turkish language? They often say, of course, English, right? So that's their first guess. But of course, it's the Arabic. Uh, it's Arabic. Uh, and, um, but language works in very different ways. And it's, it's yeah. a living, living organism. So uh, who knows what's going to happen like 20 years from now, uh, what the winds <laughs> of change will, will show well, us. Well, uh, let's hope that everything will be uh, positive. But this is uh, sociolinguistics 101. Um, I mean, languages do interact and they borrow from each other. That's very uh -huh. normal. Exactly. And then uh, we kind of, uh, you know, turkify those words. Right? Sorry mm -hmm. for this newly uh, made <laughs> verb. But yeah, they become Turkish. Uh, in the past, we didn't have a word for feedback. So we were saying feedback. Now we have dönüt, geri bildirim. So whichever mm -hmm. is going to win the war will stay. We don't know which one. <laughs> But, you know, uh, this is natural. This is, uh, I don't understand why we are resisting the, to mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. natural process. Let people decide which one is going to win, mm -hmm. Right. Okay. The, the whole idea of being sensitive in one's language use should not really connect the dots to being anti-foreign languages or yeah. anti-English. That yes. is the problem. I mean, yes, we all love Turkish. We all, for example, I see Marianne Hojam here, who's a dear colleague of mine from the program, and, and, and her kids are bilingual. Mm -hmm. And they know both Turkish and mm -hmm. English. And it's wonderful. As soon as, whenever I see them, I try to <laughs> talk to them in Turkish, although we know, I know that we can converse in English, but it's almost so much fun. I mean, Turkish is a great language. We all know this. And it's, yes, it is. I do really love Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. I mean, but being a sensitive language user should not really connect the dots to make very big assertions, very um, xenophobic, you know, it's, it shouldn't uh, add fuel to the existing um, anti-Westernness and anti-isolation, well, isolation of discourses yeah. that we've been suffering so much for so mm -hmm. long time, actually. Yeah. That is my point, Ajam. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to thank you, Ali Ajam, because, uh, the, I mean, in the chat box, I don't know whether you can see the chat box right now. Of course, people are uh, thanking you, um, Okay, uh, like hundreds of wonderful words here. <laughs> There is one question, but it is not related to your uh, talk. Uh -huh. So, uh, Azra Ujam, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask that question. Uh, it's, your question is related to the functions of lingua franca uh -huh. versus English as foreign language in context-based courses. So I guess maybe we will have another session related to that. How about that, Azraj? I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think that it is relevant uh, to this context. Yes, Amanda Ojam uh, and Marva Ojam says, why should we use uh, uh, learn English? They should learn Turkish. 
I love yeah. that statement. I love it. See, this is the, as I've said before, this is the funeral of common sense and reason. I mean, one language becomes uh, dominant because it is the language of a superpower. So one day when Turkish become, Turkey becomes a superpower, we will teach Turkish to other nations. Don't worry. I won't see it. Hopefully you will. <laughs> God, no. Or maybe your grandchildren will. Uh, but really, I mean, this ha is a topic we have never talked about before. An excellent presentation, Hojam. Thank you, so Thank much, you much. very much. for. And believe me, guys, I harassed Ali Hoca for <laughs> such a long time. <laughs> because he has a very busy schedule and he, he did spare this time for us. So thank you. I'm, I really appreciate this talk. Uh, I don't thank see you. any questions, just uh, thanking you. Uh, thank you so, so much, Ajahn. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, for choosing to spend their uh, wonderful Friday evening with us. So I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.